You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for our discussion on Rod Serling, the angry man of Hollywood, who also served in the 11th Airborne Division during World War II. Um, my name is Jeremy Holm. I am a division historian, an author, and a lecturer, um, as well as the curator of the online museum dedicated to the angels, 511pir.com. Um, I'm, I'm the author of the book, uh, When Angels Fall, the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment in World War II. Uh, I invite you to check that out on Amazon. Uh, also, we are so excited to announce that uh, our volume one of our brand new two-volume series on the history of the 11th Airborne Division in World War II is now available. Um, Down from Heaven, the 11th Airborne Division in World War II, Volume 1, Camp Tekoa through the Leyte Campaign. Now this book covers the 11th Airborne's historic beginnings at Camp Tekoa and Camp McCall, or Fort Bragg, all the way through their bloody campaign to retake the island of Leyte in late 1944. Now Down from Heaven is available on Amazon, or if you would like a signed copy, uh, you can order that through 511pir.com. Now, I feel kind of bad. I don't even have a physical copy to, to show you guys. All of our inventory is going right out the window since we announced uh, the release date. So um, you can order it on Amazon or get a signed copy on 511PIR. Um, but, it, you know, it's just been amazing to see the, the renewed interest in the 11th Airborne Division, uh, including with our, our modern Arctic Angels with the reactivation of the division in Alaska. Now, some of this incredible interest um, has been shown to us through our the wonderful reception of our video, 11th Airborne Division Facts in 11 Minutes. And if you haven't seen that yet, I'll put a link down in the description below and you can check that out. Now, in addition to being an author, lecturer, and historian for the 11th Airborne, I am also a secretary in the 11th Airborne Division Association, uh, which I invite you to join if you have served as an angel or if you would just like to be part of this amazing organization. I am rebuilding the association website right now, but you can check it out at 11thairborne.com, and we'll be working on uploading the membership forms and so forth in the next couple days. Now, with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's dive right into our topic, Rod Serling. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up watching episodes of The Twilight Zone as a kid, and of course they scared the bejesus out of me, but even at a young age, I could tell that Rod Serling was just a creative genius. Um, little did I know at the time that Rod had actually served in the same World War II unit 
as my grandfather, First Lieutenant Andrew Carrico, and that was, of course, the 11th Airborne Division. So let's look a little bit at Rod's pre-war life, and then we'll jump into his World War II service. Now, Rodman Edward Serling was born on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1924, to Samuel and Esther Serling. Rod was actually the, the second son born to the Serlings. His brother, Robert, was six years older. Now, the Serlings initially lived in Syracuse, New York, but in 1925, the family moved to Binghamton, New York, where Rod's father opened uh, a sanitary grocery store, which was a division of uh, the Cooper grocery chain, which um, Rod's mother's family uh, owned. They owned the, the grocery chain. Now, when the Great Depression hit, um, Samuel Serling had to close his store, but you know he, he wasn't going to give up. He rolled up his sleeves and he opened a wholesale butcher shop. And then Rod would actually deliver um, orders of meat to customers um, around the neighborhoods and so forth. And because of his personality and he was so likable, he actually was known for earning some pretty large tips. Now, in his free time, Rod enjoyed reading the popular magazines of the day and listening to radio shows. Um, the Serlings also would frequent the movie theater, which these things combined to kind of just spark Rod's imagination. And, you know, the future... Uh, paratrooper would put on neighborhood plays in his basement after his parents built a, a little stage down there. So he'd get all the kids involved in the neighborhood, whether they kind of wanted to or not, he'd talk them into it. Um, and then he would reenact movies that he had seen or um, stories that he had read. Now, Rod's active imagination kind of got him into a little bit of trouble in school. Um, some of his teachers said he was a lost cause. Others described him as kind of the class clown who just spent too much time daydreaming um, during class. And these same complaints would actually be raised against Rod later during World War II by his fellow paratroopers, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but not all of Rod's teachers complained um, about his imagination or his overactive you know, energy in class. Some of his teachers saw his great potential, and that included his seventh grade teacher, um, Helen Foley, who encouraged young Rod to use his talents in more you know, productive ways. So Helen was um, West Junior High School's uh, director of dramatics. Um, and, and, you know, she could just see the artistic um, capacity in Rod. So, you know, and Rod at the time was actually serving as student body class president, and he served on the Junior Red Cross Council. So, you know, he was very active in, in, in some of these leadership roles. So he could, you know, he, he had this presence that people would listen to and follow, and she knew that. So at Mrs. Foley's instance, um, Rod Serling joined his team's, his school's debate team. Um, he took part in the school plays, and uh, he actually began writing for the school newspapers, and, and that started in junior high and continued to high school. You know, in high school, Rod continued writing for the newspaper, and he became editor of his school paper, which was the Panorama, and he started to gain this reputation as kind of an activist. Now, Rod became such an excellent public speaker and presenter that he was chosen to speak during his high school uh, graduation ceremony from uh, Binghamton High School on January 28, 1943. Uh, Rod actually graduated 35th in his class. Um, now, Rod was asked to speak not just because he was a great speaker, but also because he had served as a classroom representative in the school's governing body, and he was elected to the school's general org elected as the school's general organizational president. So he was very involved in activities and leadership in his school. So he wore a lot of hats and, you know, was very involved in using his voice uh, and, influ and influence to make things happen. And, you know, since America was now at war, this is, you know, this is after Pearl Harbor, um, Rod really spent his senior year encouraging um, the, the teachers and his fellow students to really get involved in the war effort um, you know, he actually planned on leaving school early and enlisting in the service. So Rod registered with his local draft board, um, Board 452, in January of 1943. But, you know, his civics teacher, Gus, Young Gus Youngstrom, uh, persuaded Rod to wait. You know, Mr. Youngstrom told Rod, he said, you know, war is a temporary thing. Um, it ends. Education doesn't. Without your degree... Where will you be after the war? You know, and, and Rod really listened to this and he decided he would, you know, wait until he graduated. But, you know, four days after, you know, graduating on February 2nd, 1943, you know, 18 year old Rod Serling enlisted in the U.S. Army. Um, you know, he wanted to be a tail gunner uh, in B-17s and he wanted to head to Europe so he could fight Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. 
but um, Rod's eyesight was not good enough to actually enter the Air Corps. So, you know, he thought about it and he did the next best thing and he joined the U.S. paratroops. And at, this was at Fort um, Niagara. And, uh, you know, he, he had two friends that were with him, Jock Smith and John, John Mahoney. And so the three of them joined or volunteered for the parachutes. And, you know, I kind of wish that Rod had maybe describe this a little bit more before his, his death. Um, one thing is Rod Serling was listed, you know, about five feet, four inches to, you know, five feet, four and a half inches at the most. Um, but the requirements to enter the parachutes at the time was five feet, six inches. So he's at least an inch, if not two inches too short, um, to volunteer for the parachutes. And, you know, I looked up Rod's draft card and it's kind of interesting. It actually lists his height as five feet, um, five and a half inches, which was almost one inch taller than he really was, but still below the official requirements. So I am kind of curious how this all played out. Um, you know, just to give you an idea about this America's most decorated soldier in World War II, Audie Murphy, he actually tried out for the parachutes as well. But like Rod, he was a little short. So Audie Murphy was rejected from the parachutes, but you know, Rod Serling was accepted. So how Rod Serling made it past the initial acceptance um board i have no idea but one of his friends sergeant frank lewis later said that private serling talked his way into the parachutes which that completely sounds like rod serling so somehow rod serling made it past the initial uh testing board and he and his two friends jacques and john boarded trains headed down to a little camp outside a little town um, far off the beaten path, which we know today as Camp Tekoa. So Camp Tekoa is, of course, located outside just beautiful Tekoa, Georgia. If you haven't had a chance to visit there, I highly recommend it. Um, but Camp Tekoa is kind of famous in the airborne history as the birthplace of some legendary airborne units, including um, the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which if you've seen Band of Brothers or read the book, that's the 506th. And so they were formed uh, there at Camp Tekoa, and they'd actually just left right before Rod and his friends arrived, and the three were assigned to the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment under the legendary Colonel Oren D. Hard Rock Hogan. Um, you know, Hard Rock earned his nickname because he just, he pushed his men really hard, and he was a firm disciplinarian, but he was actually extremely fair as well, and, you know, all these young boys that were coming to his regiment came to find that out over time. So Rod may have talked his way into the parachutes, but now he had another problem. He actually had to make his way through Colonel Hogan's extremely difficult entrance requirements to make it into the 511th. Um, Hogan's requirements were so strict that the War Department actually told him that he needed to ease them up because they'd already sent 8,000 potential recruits for his regiment of only 2000 and those, and you know, 8,000 had been rejected. And so this is what Rod Sterling was coming into. So he had to, Rod had to show up before an acceptance panel of regimental officers or battalion officers. And he was just in his underwear because the officers wanted to see how physically fit he was. They wanted to see what, what shape he was in. And they would ask him questions to kind of check his intelligence and, and just get to know his character if he was really willing to fight. Um, so Rod made his way through that, and then he had to pass fitness tests, which included uh, timed runs up and down Mount Curahy, which if you know anything about that, is just three miles up, three miles down, just this difficult, uh, a tough run, which, you know, Mount Curahy is just great. Again, if you have a chance to go visit Camp Tekoa, they do a wonderful World War II weekend every year, usually the 1st of October. Uh, come check it out. And then you can actually go run Curahy with everybody. It's, it's great. But so Rod made it past all the requirements. So he and his friends, Jock Smith and John Mahoney, uh, were all accepted into the regiment. But Jock and John were sent to E Company while uh, Rod was sent to regimental headquarters. And, you know, I think Rod had a lot going for him. You know, he was a former writer. Uh, he knew how to organize facts. He was intelligent and, you know, he was an engaging in personality. So I think he was sent to RHQ just because, you know, he'd be, he'd be helpful there. He could, you know, do the reports and, you know, um, 
keep track of the records and so on and so forth. So his talents would be very well used in the headquarters company. And, and, and again, Rod certainly ran Curahee. And uh, again, if you've ever attempted that, you know why some of the paratroopers called it that damn hill. Um, but Rod also endured Colonel Hogan's extremely difficult physical uh, training schedule. I mean, Hard Rock just pushed his men hard because he was one of America's first um, parachute qualified officers. And he had friends that were, you know, um, overseas in some of the other parachute regiments. And he knew exactly what his regiment was going to be expected to do. And he wanted his men to be in the best shape of their life. So, you know, Rod and um, the 511 spent, you know, anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, depending on which battalion you were in. And then they were sent down to a new camp outside Camp Hoffman, North Carolina. And this became known as Camp McCall. And so, so Rod Serling was there with the 511th when Camp McCall was dedicated. And that dedication, of course, happened on May 1st, 1943. And Camp McCall is named after uh, Private Tommy McCall, who was one of the first, who was one of America's first paratroopers killed in the war. Now, the 511th was sent to Camp McCall to join the new 11th Airborne Division under Major General Joseph May Swing who was just another legend in the airborne community. And General Swing initiated some tough physical training requirements right off the bat, kind of like Colonel Hogan did at, at Camp Tekoa. Um, but after really a couple months, uh, Rod and the 511th were sent by battalion down to Fort Benning, uh, Fort Benning's jump school. And there Rod went through you know, three weeks of, of uh, the physical training and the jump training and then his qualification jumps and so forth. They actually skipped the first week, which was all the, um, the physical, uh, well, it was just mostly physical was phase A and the 511 skipped that. So Rod graduated, he got his jump wings and, you know, he came back to Camp McCall with the 511th. And if you know anything about airborne history, Paratroopers are just a cocky bunch, and Rod Serling fit right in, certainly. You know, Rod was very proud to be a paratrooper during the war and after as well. Um, there's a lot of publicity shots and, and, and a lot of the videos, the monologues he would do. You can actually see this silver bracelet on his left wrist, and um, on that bracelet, he had it specially made. He had, uh, and he had jump wings engraved, and, and he wore that, as far as I know, up until his death. And, you know, I... I always liked Rod's statement where he said, if you didn't jump out of the plane in time, you'd be five miles beyond where you were supposed to go with the comparative comfort of your own colleagues. So it behooved you to get out of that door as fast as you could. So again, after jump school, Rod and the 11th Airborne spent 1943 and, and really some intensive training, all of which was put to the test during the Knollwood maneuvers in December of 1943. Um, you know, at the time, America's leadership was considering breaking up airborne divisions into regimental combat teams, and and that was the result of of the problems associated with the airborne drops during Operation Husky. And the 11th Airborne uh, Division, um, as well as the 82nd, 101st, and Airborne Command, you know, of course, they all disagreed with this whole idea. And the 11th Airborne, the 11th Airborne's general swing, um, you know. He proposed this test, the Nolwood maneuvers, where he would take the 11th Airborne Division to um, practice or actually test uh, these new concepts that they had developed to make sure the problems of Operation Husky never happened again. You have to remember that this was before D-Day and um, Dwight Eisenhower um, was very concerned about utilizing airborne divisions in D-Day after what he had seen in Operation Husky. So General Swing said, let's put this to the test, and they did. And the 11th Airborne was so successful during the Knollwood maneuvers that um, a lot of their tactics and concepts were used by General Eisenhower um, and his staff, of course, during the uh, Normandy landings uh, in June of 1944. So it's kind of a cool thing that nobody really talks about, but Rod Serling uh, and his 11th Airborne uh, Division helped save the future of America's airborne um, units and also kind of paved the way a bit for the D-Day airborne uh, drops um, in 44. Now, something happened at Camp McCall that led to Rod being sent to the regiment's demolitions platoon, which was known as the Suicide Squad. These are the guys that would use 
um, explosive charges to eliminate um, you know enemy reinforced positions and obstacles and and, and so forth. Um, it was a dangerous job, and and Rod's friend in the demolitions platoon, you know, Sergeant Frank Lewis, he he just said that Rod screwed up somewhere. Um, he got on someone's nerves, and the rumor that I heard was that Rod Serling told a regimental officer exactly what he could do uh, with an assigned task, basically where he could stick it, and that doesn't sound like Rod Serling at all, right? Um, so. Rod's now sent to the demolitions platoon and, you know, kind of a cool thing that meant that Rod was trained a bit to act as a pathfinder during the Knollwood maneuvers. So the demo platoon, um, was sent up to, uh, Lauren Maxton, uh, airfield before the maneuvers to act as pathfinders for the 11th airborne during the maneuvers. So that's why you'll sometimes see Rod Serling listed as a pathfinder, um, he wasn't an official pathfinder, but he did get some training as one and he did act as one, um, during the Knollwood maneuvers. But I, I mentioned his friend, you know, Sergeant Frank Lewis and Frank Lewis and Rod Serling were, were great friends, um, in the demolitions platoon. And it's really easy to see why, you know, Rod of course was a creative genius, just this fantastic writer and speaker and his just imagination would go, you know, a million miles a minute. Um, Frank Lewis was a, uh, a cartoonist, this great artist. And, and in the 511th, he was known as the 511th Ernie Pyle. And you can kind of see some of his sketches on the screen here. So you can definitely see why these two were, were kindred spirits. And, and the both of them served under um, First Lieutenant Robert Keyes, who, you know, at McCall, Lieutenant Keyes told his demolitions men to always carry at least one block of, um, you know, a demolition kit uh, of C2 with them wherever they went until one of the guys, nobody said who, but one of the guys took one of the blocks and, um, you know, the detonator and they dropped it in a sewer in Pinehurst, North Carolina, which of course, you know, explosive results there. So Lieutenant Keyes was ordered to, to gather up all of his men's um, demolition charges and, and just get rid of them. Right. So the story goes that, you know, Rod and the demolition platoon all got their blocks of, you know, C2 together and, and they buried them, um, or they put them in a big hole and then Lieutenant Keyes detonated, uh, the whole pile and it just blew out windows for miles, which of course, you know, got everybody in a lot of trouble. But, you know, they weren't at Camp McCall too much longer. They actually left and went down to Camp Polk, Louisiana um, for more maneuvers and training. You know, this let Rod and the other angels of the 11th Airborne Division uh, train in the area swamps, which kind of surprised them because they all thought they were going to Europe, but they ended up going to the Pacific Theater to fight. So training in the jungles or the swamps of Louisiana really trained them to fight in the jungles of the Pacific. Um, but, a the, but Camp Polk was home to several armored units who really were annoyed that, that the 11th Airborne was now on their post. So this led to barroom brawls and fights just all across, you know, the camp. And Rod Serling was actually involved in several of these. Like he was known as a fighter, a, a, an aggressive fighter. Um, he was almost described as being a berserker when he got into fistfights and so forth. But, you know, after after a few uh, months there, the 11th Airborne loaded onto trains again and they started heading north and everybody was placing bets. Are we going, you know, we're going to turn right and go over to Europe? Are we going to go left and go to the Pacific? And eventually the trains turned left and they went to California uh, to Camp Stoneman, where they stayed for a few weeks before they boarded ships and, and headed to New Guinea. But while they were at Camp Stoneman, um, Colonel Orrin H Hogan, uh, you know, gathered the 511th. So Rod was there. And he took them on a march uh, on Camp Stoneman's um, uh, road march course. And I believe it was like 12 miles. And Colonel Hogan said, we're going to beat the record. And they did. They, they beat the camp record by almost an hour, which you know set a new record that was never beat during the war. Um, so kind of another cool thing that Rod Serling was a part of. Um, then in May of 1944, Rod and the 11th boarded their ships and they sailed across the Pacific to Dobodora, New Guinea, um, where they would spend five months training and acclimating to fighting in the Pacific's jungles and, and mountains. 
Um, and it was on New Guinea that Rod Serling got involved in the division's boxing tournaments. So you hear there was a boxer uh, during the service, and that's really where it started was on New Guinea. Um, you know, Rod said that he, he fought in 17 matches, and uh, his nose was broken during a semifinal match. And then Rod also tried for the Golden Gloves, but he didn't quite make it. But this, this all goes to show just what a fighter Rod Serling was. Um, you know, some have said that he was trying to prove himself because he was so short. He was just trying to show that he was tough and a fighter, um, which may or may not be true. Now, Rod had another great experience on New Guinea. Um, Jack Benny's USO show came to perform for the 11th Airborne um, in their 8,000 seat amphitheater, which their engineers had just cut into the hillside. And so Rod was actually invited to write uh, kind of a a propaganda script, kind of a um, patriotic um, script that would just then be performed by Jack Benny and his group. And the recording was sent uh, to units around the world and then all across the nation. So it's kind of interesting. You know, Rod Serling tried writing for the radio before the war without much success. And here he was performing, you know, with Jack Benny and writing uh, something that would be heard around the world, which luckily for us was not the last time he would do something like that, nor was it the last time that he and Jack Benny would perform together. You know, Rod made a hilarious appearance on Jack Benny's uh, show after the war in 1963, and it really shows Rod Serling's sense of humor. Um, again, he's described as the angry man of Hollywood, and a lot of his scripts are, are you know, very thought-provoking, but some are dark. But he had a great sense of humor. So I'll put a link down to that video or put a link to that video down in the description. I definitely invite you to check that out. Now, two months later, um, Rod and the 11th Airborne boarded ships to sail to Leyte, um, where they would spend 33 days fighting in the jungles and the mountains against Imperial Japan. Now, I, I cover this campaign in full detail in our two books, When Angels Fall and Down from Heaven. But just to summarize it for you, a lot of the paratroopers told me that Leyte was hell and a nightmare. Now, Rod and the 511th PIR were sent uh, from the east coast across kind of the waistline of Leyte over to the west coast. And, you know, in, in those 33 days, they just endured, you know, constant rains, mud, tropical diseases, starvation, leeches, um, insects of all kinds, bonsai attacks from the enemy. Um, snipers. Um, it, it was just, again, my grandpa just said it was hell. Um, and, and they actually were up on a, a um, hilltop outside Mahonag, and they called it Rock Hill after Colonel Hogan. And um, Rod and you know RHQ and the other units that were there spent about a week with nothing to eat. And Rod and his friend, um, Private First Class Dean White, you know, they were talking about it kind of towards the end of this week and just you know, the hunger pains has started to kind of go away because it's just what happens when your body is starving to that point. And uh, Private White and Private Serling just both said, you know, we're probably going to die here. And um, just when they were at their lowest um, and the enemy was attacking their position every night, um, you know, the enemy was all around Rock Hill. Um, but then one afternoon, the clouds broke and the sound of aircraft engines filled the air. And so Rod and his buddies in RHQ, really all across the regiment, that, you know, again, all the units that were on Rock Hill, you know, they just got excited because they're like, oh my gosh, you know, resupply is coming. And Rod's close friend, Private Melvin Levy, jumped out of his foxhole and he just starts dancing around. You know, he's almost singing. He's so excited. And, you know, Melvin was a New Yorker like Rod. And he started saying, you know, like, chow call, boys, chow call. And then he told everybody, he's like, hey, you know, you got to get out your aircraft identification cards because you got to know if that's a P-40 or a Piper Cub, you know, and he just goes on like this, just telling jokes and just, you know, just excited. And everybody's excited because they're just, again, a week of hunger, monsoon rains, enemy attacks, like just, just a little food in those conditions meant everything to them. And, you know, Melvin continues, he like starts listing off all these, you know, these foods and these recipes that are going to be dropped via airmail, you know, and, and, um, you know, the paratroopers just cheered as these red and green parachutes just start popping open and coming down with supplies and so forth. Um, 
But then the planes turn around and the excitement kind of turns to uh, maybe fear or just, you know, just, oh my gosh, because the, the Piper Cubs were coming back and the, the guys in the back um, or the pilots, depending on which size they were, uh, would just start pushing out these huge K ration ammunition boxes out the back and they would hit the ground and they would just, if they were C ration cans, they would just explode and the cans would go everywhere. And, you know, so the paratroopers are just running back and diving into their foxholes and, you know, it became a bit of chaos. But Private Levy was just, I don't know if he was just so excited the food was coming. Um, you know, when you're without food for a week mentally, you know, some things are starting to slow down. But Private Levy just stayed out in the open, just kind of singing and continuing his monologue. And, you know, the other paratroopers are telling him to get down, get down. There's a story of a sergeant uh, trying to, you know, get Private Levy in a foxhole and he doesn't. And one of the big ration boxes, which weigh about 50 pounds or so, just came right down and landed right on Private Levy's um, shoulders and it decapitated him instantly. And Rod Serling was just off to the side and he saw the whole thing happen. Um, which just, you know, I can only imagine how shocking and, you know, it wasn't the first death that Rod had seen, but this was one of his close, close friends. So the men of Private Levy's, uh, regimental headquarters, um, you know, they, they created a pon or a poncho stretcher with just some limbs and a poncho and they carried, um, Melvin's body over to the makeshift, um, cemetery on Rock Hill. And while they're doing that, Rod Serling made a Star of David out of uh, twigs and small branches to honor his friend's Jewish heritage. Now, Mel Melvin's death was, of course, difficult for Rod and was one of the many combat experiences that left just a lasting impression on Rod Serling. And, and it's interesting to watch episodes of The Twilight Zone, uh, the ones that deal with war and combat, because you can really see that they were written by somebody who knows just how visceral combat is and just how painful it is to watch one of your buddies die. And Rod Serling spent, again, over a month on Leyte fighting in these conditions and seeing friends and buddies and comrades die in just some of the worst ways. Um, so moving forward, the 511th pushes across Leyte and, you know, they're heading towards the West Coast and it was the 511th that actually broke the last line of enemy defenses so that the division could then head down to Ormoc, uh, Ormoc Bay and where they were resupplied and, and uh, just for them, the war in Leyte was over. And, and after the 511th actually broke through that last line, they were told to wait. And they were all kind of mad to watch the 187th Glider Infantry Regiment, which was also in the division, but they kind of came through their lines and then made the victory march down to, to the beach. Um, but after a couple of days, you know, Rod and the 511th were told to get back on their feet, that they were heading down to the coast. Rod just said that this all happened early in the morning. Um, it, was, it was a gray morning carved out of gray clay and shadowed by fog. And you have to remember, again, they're coming from the heights and then they're walking down to the beaches and so forth. And this is during monsoon season on Leyte. So, Rod's regiment, the 511th PIR, suffered horrendous casualties on Leyte, um, and and their columns stretched out um, for over a mile on this muddy trail. You know they were they were carrying their wounded out on stretchers, and Rod himself was actually wounded. You know, so he was hobbling along the trail. Um, his knee had been hit um, by shrapnel, and you know it, it was a wound that would bother him for the rest of his life you know his family would say that sometimes he would walk down the stairs and his knee would just give out and he would tumble down the stairs you know so so rod you know said he didn't feel like celebrating his birthday i mean it was his birthday when they're coming out of the hills um it was his 20th birthday but he said it was he didn't want to celebrate it on a god forsaken mountaintop and and rod wrote that it was not the weather it was the mood i remember the kind of mood that is the province of combat and is never fully understood by those who have not lived with the anguish of war. And Rod Serling knew the anguish of war. Again, he had faced the enemy uh, in the jungle and had been involved with, you know, fighting off several enemy of the enemy's bonsai attacks, you know, um, 
a lot of those happened at night and it just turned to hand to hand fighting in their foxholes. Um, it was just, it was brutal. It was awful. Uh, Rod had buried friends uh, in the hills of Leyte and, you know, he had had to remove leeches from his body and he had slept with enemy dead all around him. Um, and again, he had been wounded. A mortar, enemy mortar shell had landed and sprayed him with shrapnel. Um, so yeah, Rod Serling knew just how bad war could be. And my grandfather, First Lieutenant Andrew Carrico, was actually ahead of Rod Serling. Grandpa was marching with 2nd Battalion, and Rod Serling was back with regimental headquarters. Um, and as the, as the 511th column was just trudging down that muddy trail, um, one paratrooper at the head of the column stopped. And, you know, when one stops, the guys behind him wonder if he's seen something, has he seen the enemy? And somebody kind of starts crouching down, but then the paratrooper just turns to the guys around him and he says, it's Christmas. And a few minutes later, you know, they start moving again. And a few minutes later, um, one of those tired, dirty paratroopers just starts singing. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Which is a great song because the 11th Airborne Division was known as the angels. This was kind of one of their Christmas songs, you know, they would sing. And so as this trooper's singing, other troopers start singing in and then more start singing in, you know. And, and um, you know, of course, they used to get down to, you know, Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus to thee be all glory given, Son of the Father, now in flesh appearing. So they're singing about that special Christmas morning, you know, over 2,000 years ago as they're coming down from the hills. Just some of them talked about, you know, their boots were rotted away. They, they were just you know, somewhere barefoot. Their uniforms were, were torn apart or covered in blood from carrying wounded com uh, comrades. You know, their hands were just dirty from digging in the mud. Um, most of, well, not most, um, a good portion of the 511th were sick with tropical diseases. And so, you know, one trooper who was healthier would have to help the trooper behind him down because that trooper was so sick sometimes they'd carry each other's rifles. So you can just imagine all this going on and the troopers just start singing, Oh, come all ye faithful. And, uh, you know, Rod Serling wrote of that morning, he said, I continued to lift my feet one after another, and suddenly I wasn't aware of the cold rain or the mud. I gave no thought to the sickening ache deep inside the gut that had been with me for so many days. Someone had transformed the world. We sang as we led the wounded by the hand and carried the litters and looked back on the row of homemade crosses we left behind. It had come indeed, the holy day, the day of all days. It was Christmas. Reading Rod Serling's words of that holiday miracle in 1944, um, 60 years later, my grandfather, First Lieutenant Andrew Carrico, uh, softly told us with tears in his eyes, you know, I remember. And Rod Serling's words about that Christmas miracle of 1944, they, they remind me of uh, one of his opening monologues during the Twilight Zone episode, A Quality of Mercy. And, and this is what Rod said. The place is the Philippine Islands. The men are what's left of a platoon of American infantry, whose dulled and tired eyes set deep in dulled and tired faces can now look toward a miracle, that moment when the nightmare appears to be coming to an end. Rod knew what it was like to be one of those last members of a platoon of American infantrymen what it was like to see dull and tired eyes on the dulled and tired faces of his comrades. Again, Rod was a proud paratrooper. Everybody in the 511th was, but they had fought as infantrymen from across Leyte. And as Rod and the 511th walked down from the hills of Leyte, they were looking towards a miracle that their nightmare on Leyte was over. Now, the 11th Airborne Division rested for about a month on Leyte before they began their assault on southern Luzon. So Rod and the 511th uh, jumped onto Tagaytay Ridge on February 3rd, 1944, or 1945, excuse me. Uh, and then they pushed north into southern Manila, um, where they ran right into Japan's famous Genko Line. So what the Genko Line was, uh, the enemy had taken 
uh, naval and anti-aircraft guns off the sunken ships in Manila Bay, and they brought them over and they just they placed them um, all along southern Manila, and then they created these cement pillboxes and other fortifications. They put in machine guns and and mortar positions, and it was just this defensive monstrosity that the 11th Airborne Division had to break through on their own. They had very, very, very limited support, uh, almost no armored support and really just a lot of the, you know, the other pack howitzers and so forth. So that meant that Rod Serling and the demolitions platoon, um, all the demo men actually kept very busy blasting these bunkers and other fortifications and obstacles so that the 11th Airborne could get into Southern Manila, which they actually did. Um, they broke through in just a couple days and then they were involved in the very, very heavy fighting in Manila itself. You know, and during one engagement, um, you know, Rod remembers a Japanese soldier uh, pointing his rifle right at him. And the Japanese soldier was just quicker on the draw. And, you know, Rod thought he was going to die. And another um, paratrooper just shot right past Rod's shoulder and just killed the enemy so- or killed the Japanese soldier right there. You know, Manila was really it was just brutal street fighting. It was just house to house, you know, block by block. Um, just, it cost the 11th Airborne Division dearly. Um, within a few weeks, some companies were down to just 40% strength. And so again, Rod saw the worst of the worst. He saw death on a daily basis. He saw what Imperial Japan had done to the people of Manila, the torture and the rape and the murder and just the destruction on a mass scale. And, you know, I, I say that because I hope the people of the Philippines really understand and appreciate uh, what Rod Serling and the 11th Airborne Division did to liberate them from Imperial Japan. I know that they did in 1945 um, during a celebration, you know, during a lull in the fighting, there was just the the, the people in, in this barrio in, in Manila just decided to hold a, a victory celebration. And so there was a stage and they had these little performances and there's some, you know, some eating going on but the enemy started dropping shells um, onto the town square. So the local Filipinos and the 11th Airborne Troopers all just, you know, make for whatever shelter they can find. Except for Rod Serling, he, he looks on the stage and he sees that there's a, a Filipina still on stage, one of the performers, and the shells are just coming in and she's scared of not moving. So he runs out into the shell fire, grabs this woman and pulls her to safety. Um, you know, of course this earns him the bronze star. And then during the division's, well, the regiment's battle for Manila's Rizal Stadium, um, which is kind of ironic because a couple of months later, the 11th Airborne Division would be playing football in the stadium. Um, but during the battle for the stadium, Rod remembers very vividly shooting uh, a Japanese soldier right on third base. It was just one of those things that just really stuck in his mind. Um, but then on March 1st, 1945, Rod was transferred from the demolitions platoon to service company under Captain Abraham Snyder. Um, and then he went, he actually went back to New Guinea to recuperate further from his wounds. Again, he had been hit by shrapnel um, in the wrist and the knee, and those were still bothering him. So they just pulled him off the line, sent him back to recuperate. Um, and then he came back to service company where he stayed until August 30th, 1945, when the 11th Airborne Division was sent to be the first Allied unit to land on Japan at Itsuki Airfield outside Tokyo. Um, So a lot of people don't know this, but Rod Serling was one of the first Allied soldiers onto Japan um, where he landed and helped secure the airfield and kind of the surrounding area for um, General Robert Eichelberger who landed and then they were tasked with guarding the area because General Douglas MacArthur himself landed. Um, And then a few days later, the 11th Airborne Division was tasked with guarding the departure docks um, where the dignitaries left to go out to the USS Missouri for the official surrender ceremony. So most of the angels remember feeling just this great sense of relief when the atomic, when the atomic bombs were dropped and, and word came down that Japan was surrendering because Again, Rod Serling and the 11th Airborne Division, they were planning to drop onto Japan if the Allies had invaded Japan. And a lot of them told me, they just said, like, we were not going to survive. 
like almost all of our division was going to die in Japan. I mean, that's just what they were expecting. So, you know, so when Japan surrendered, there was this great sense of relief for everybody except for Rod Serling uh, to, to a point that is, you see some of the 11th airborne division, some of their earliest troopers um, now had enough points to start going home. And, after it was indicated that Japan was going to surrender, some of those troopers actually started going home, and Rod almost had enough points to go. Um, but on September 2nd, which was the day before Japan officially surrendered, Rod received a message through the Red Cross that told him that his father, Samuel, Serling, uh, Samuel Lawrence Serling, had died of a heart attack. And Rod immediately asked for um, emergency leave to go home, but this was denied. And, and that's probably because every hand was needed on deck to help, you know, complete Japan's, sur- complete Japan's surrender, make sure everything went smoothly and so forth. But I don't know all the details, but I imagine that the pain of losing his father and having the military deny his request to go home, you know, combined with the many, many long months of brutal and bloody combat and the nightmares that came with it probably influenced, this all probably combined to influence some of Rod Serling's anti-war views. So instead of going home, Rod spent the next four months in occupation duty in Japan. Um, But then finally, he did board the USS Herald of the Morning for the voyage home um, as part of Operation Magic Carpet, which was Uh, America's big effort to bring servicemen home from overseas. And so after nearly three years of military service, Rod Serling was discharged on January 13th, 1946. So all that said, and all that covered, we know that from his pre-war high school years, Rod Serling was very patriotic and um, passionate about um, being involved in the war effort. So what kind of soldier was he? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, some of Rod's buddies, um, you know, his, well, his platoon sergeant said he didn't have the wit or aggressiveness required for combat. You know, other angels remember that Private Serling was often, you know, off on his own, leaving without orders, you know, writing stories or just lost in his imagination. Um, he would forget detail duties. And, and although he was a, a very proud paratrooper, some, some said he wasn't very airborne, um, but there's contradictions to this. Again, he was very aggressive in his boxing and the fighting with the, the armored units at, at Camp Polk and so forth. And then if we look at what Rod Serling did do during the war, you know, he completed jump training and then General Swing actually sent his paratroopers through glider training. So he did that as well. He had some pathfinder training. He had some demolitions training as well. Um, and then he, the fact that he even made it into the 511th PIR and past Colonel Orrin Hogan's strict requirements, that says a lot right there. Um, but then you look at the stories that maybe Rod didn't tell. We know he was involved with brutal, up-close, vicious, hand-to-hand fighting with the Japanese, uh, fighting off their bonsai attacks um, on, on Leyte, and then in Luzon, he was involved with you know, blasting these um, reinforced enemy positions, which was very dangerous. I mean, the Japanese knew they see a guy running towards them with a satchel charge, um, take him out before, you know. So the demo platoon was called the Suicide Squad for a reason. And Rod did all this, you know. So in some aspects, he might have been a a bit more of a um, easily lost in imagination soldier, but he was brave and he did some incredible things. You know, and including, let's remember, he rushed out into artillery fire to rescue um, that Filipina um, from the stage, you know, risking his life once again. So for the nearly, you know, for, for the world, Rod Serling is this creative genius, this writer, producer, and, and so forth. But for the 2,000 men of the 511th PIR um, and the 8,000 men of the 11th Airborne Division, Private Rod Serling was one of them. He was one of those young boys who answered his nation's call at the time of, at, when they were needed and became a paratrooper, um, the elite of the elite in World War II. Rod Serling was an angel, an 11th Airborne Division angel, and a liberating angel who helped liberate Leyte and Luzon and the people of the Philippines. And he fought alongside his buddies, 
um, you know, through through hell on Leyte and Luzon. And and it was because of those experiences that Rod would suffer from nightmares for the rest of his life. And and Rod Serling definitely suffered from what we would call PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, his daughter Anne Serling would say that you know her father frequently had nightmares, and you know, in the morning she would ask him what had happened, and Rod Serling would say that the Japanese were coming at him again. And so again, Rod had seen bonsai attacks, and he had seen his friends die, and and he'd had to do these difficult things in in the battle for Manila and Luzon, and, and I think all those things would just come back to him. Um, you know, Rod used his his vivid imagination and his work um, to to deal with his wartime experiences. You know, he said he said at the end of the service he was bitter about everything, and when he got out of the service, he turned to writing to just get it off his chest. That was the way he he faced those nightmares and dealt with those demons. Um, you know, one piece that he wrote that is particularly powerful, which I encourage you to go check out, is called First Squad, First Platoon. And while the soldiers that Rod writes about are, you know, fic- they have fictitious names, the places they fight in that piece were places that Rod Serling uh, and the 511th saw combat in. And, you know, First Squad, First Platoon, it's it's real and it's raw. And, and again, I invite you to go read that. Um, you can just feel how much Rod Serling was getting off his chest with that piece. Um you know, in fact, you can see from the personal, almost intimate way that Rod Serling writes about, you know, combat and, and death that he was very familiar with both. And given how many stories he wrote that dealt with the paranormal, you know, with ghosts, um, you know, I, I just personally wonder how many of, you know, Rod's fallen comrades' faces that he saw um, throughout his life. And, and the truth is, you know, like so many veterans, you know, the war was never really over for Rod Serling. Um, you know, the war ended itself, but the nightmares, the losses, the flashbacks, those would just continue on. And, and I think it's that pain, that angst that drove him to write. Um, it became fuel for his creative fires. So in a way, if we look through the lens of the Twilight Zone, we have World War II to thank for all these wonderful, you know, Rod Serling stories and movies and, and episodes and so forth. You know, and, and as a fellow writer and, and a creator um, and just as an American, um, you know, I am extremely grateful for Rod Serling's example and his willingness to fight for fight to defend our freedoms uh, and the freedoms of others. And, and, and it's something he did until his early death at age 50 from um, complications that uh, arose during open heart surgery on uh, June 25th, 1975. Rod Serling went and he fought against tyranny in World War II. And instead of living a quiet life afterwards, he, he continued to fight. But you know, after the war, his, his enemies became you know, censorship, racism, bigotry, um, just some of these hot topics and, and, and subjects that he touched on during his episodes. You know, Rod had witnessed firsthand um, what happens when evil takes over, what things are like when a government or empire or kingdom uh, treats its own people as inconsequential beings. And, you know, so you can see the way he writes the value of life in some of these episodes. Uh, it's no wonder he wrote, any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. So yeah, Rod Serling saw plenty of death during World War II. But how lucky for us that he worked so hard to bring new ideas, new creations to life through his work. In his piece, First Squad, First Platoon, Rod wrote, I want you to read my stories and a lot of others like them. I want you to know what shrapnel and 88s and mortar shells and mustard gas mean. I want you to feel, no matter how vicariously, a semblance of the feeling of a torn limb, a burnt patch of flesh, the crippling, numbing sensation of fear, the hopelessness, the hopeless emptiness of fatigue. All these things are complementary to the province of war, and they should be taught and demonstrated in classrooms along with the more heroic aspects of uniforms and flags and honor and patriotism. 
While we stand in awe of Rod Serling's creative genius, may we never forget the services and sacrifices of Private Rod Serling, nor those of his brothers in the 11th Airborne Division in World War II. So there you have it, a very brief overview of Rod Serling's uh, military service during World War II. Um, I, I hope it helped you come to understand just what this amazing man went through as a paratrooper, um, but I hope it also helped you understand this great veteran even more. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you'd like to find out more about the 11th Airborne Division, I invite you to check out um, our two websites, 511pir.com or 11thairborne.com, um, or subscribe to this channel for future videos and updates, which we'll be putting out in the future. And if you'd like to learn more about Rod Serling and his World War II units, the 511PIR and the 11th Airborne Division, I invite you to check out our two books, When Angels Fall, the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment in World War II, and Down from Heaven, the History of the 11th Airborne Division in World War II. Again, both books are available on Amazon, or if you'd like signed copies, you can order those at 511PIR.com. Thanks for joining me today, and remember, Down from Heaven comes 11. Airborne all the way.